I thought I could start today's talk with a small story I read back in high school um, that kind of had a profound impact in the way I see my, my world. And I'm sure everyone can refer back to a book or a story they read in a similar sense. Um, the book, the, the story is called The Third Level. It's by Jack Finney. And it's about this ordinary worker in New York City called Charlie. One, in one ordinary routine commute through Grand Central Station, he gets lost and he stumbles across a, a level that doesn't exist. He stumbles ac across the third level. Um, and when he emerges in this secret level that doesn't exist, he finds himself in a more pleasant environment. He calls it a, a more amicable um, world where things are cheaper and people have more time to relax. So with this sheer excitement, he gets out of that world and goes back to his wife to share the story, obviously. But his wife tells him he's absolutely crazy that he should go see a psychiatrist. So he does exactly that. And the psychiatrist also tells him that, I'm sorry, buddy, but the third level doesn't exist. And what you just went through is, is, is a type of escapism from reality. And, and this modern world that we live in, it's, it's normal to feel like that. But the, the truth is that it doesn't exist, and you need to go back to being a good husband, good worker, and forget about this delusion. So he gets extremely discouraged. But the funny twist in the end of the story is that he receives a postcard from the very psychiatrist that told him, stop imagining things like that. And he is basically saying that he was able to find a third level, and the difference is that he decided to stay there. So his, Charlie's dream was literally stolen from him. When I was in architecture school, I was confronted with a dilemma in one of my studio projects. It was about, it was, the project was about developing a standard uh, <clears throat> high-rise condominium tower in downtown LA for a developer. And I just didn't find it uh, resonating with me because what we were basically asked to do was calculate floor ratio, figure out how many units we could squeeze into that site and see how much money I can make for, for a developer. So in, in a, in a kind of naive re reaction, I decided to propose this drawing. In this drawing, you see people flying. There's no walls. There's no floor plates. There's no sense of private versus public. It's all mixed up. It's, it's, uh, it's a more egalitarian space. And I remember my school director was passing by, and she was telling me I was totally crazy. What are you smoking? Get back to drawing real plans. So I kind of got discouraged, but I didn't forget that moment. Ten years after that, I find myself back in Panama. It was Panama where I read that book. And um, it's Panama where I kind of find my home now. I found the love of my life here. And I'm fond for, of all the natural environment that Panama has to offer. So I came back here, and I'm, I see this. And superficially, when you see this, you're thinking, wow, the economy is bustling, you know? And it's true, Panama is considered one of the steadiest and fastest growing economies in the world, just like our other speakers mentioned before. But when you take a closer examination to what's going on, you don't see much of this wealth being shared in the street level. A lot of the problems you see in the street, it's, it's so, it's, there's such a big discrepancy with this picture. So, I was falling into a conundrum. What can I do now that I find Panama home? What is it that I can do to, to help this situation? How can I find a third level for the Panamanian? And surely it's not going to happen. Panama is not going to just stumble into an accident and find a third level like Charlie did in Grand Central Station. So <clears throat> maybe flying people and things like that don't make any sense in architecture school. But when I started to meet with my team, and started talking about these issues in Panama, flying people started making complete sense. How can we liberate Panamanians mentally and intellectually from the constraints that they are in? How can we provide a way out for them? And then you look at the panorama of Panama a little more closer, and you see that there's all the multinationals are headquartered here because of the incentive the country provides. Um, all this. Co uh, companies are here because of those economic benefits, 
but don't regard Panama as a real market because the population is so small, the country is so small, they don't really regard it as, as, as their territory for marketing. Also, you look at, you look at the situation where they don't really do anything, um, they don't really give back to the struggle of the Panamanians because they don't regard it as a big market. You see less and less Panamanians holding managerial positions in their jobs. And you see, in the same time, you see all these foreigners taking advantage of the business environment here. It's ironic. Not to mention the unprecedented environmental damage we've been seeing in the past decade because of all this infrastructural development in tourism and the energy sector. So the homework started becoming a little heavier, the cloud. It's not just how can we do this. So what I decided to do is I started meet with my group every day, every day. We started complaining, complaining like everyone does, but then we started thinking, what is something we could do to contribute to this dilemma? And we we're thinking, OK, maybe we can change everything, but we can provide some tools. How can we provide tools for more integrated uh, and educated decision making for the public? How can we provide tools for more community participation and more better self-organization. And ultimately, how can we provide a tool for better exchange of information, especially between groups like mine that really care about the situation? So what we set out to do is invent this project called Festival Abierto. We knew that it had to be open and in a fun environment. Um, and why not a festival? And it works everywhere in the world. It could work in Panama, right? So. Leveraging in the power of good public spaces, we went out to scout out where we could make this intervention. We found Parque Omar as being the central park of Panama City, the biggest park, the most accessible, but also noticed that it's completely underutilized. So we decided to make Parque Omar the place where we're going to plant this seed and, and create a portal for the third level. So what we did is, in an, in an experimental kind of spirit, to create a social experiment, we invited dozens of NGOs and social movements in Panama that are doing good things already. And we invited them to participate in our sustainable pavilions in the park. We carefully designed with a group of architects and engineers custom and unique spaces where the NGOs could do their exhibition, their workshops, and um, a place where they could interact and connect with the public. So what happened is that we were able to create a, a small, mini, sustainable world inside the park. This year, we call the pavilions the coral reef because of the open-ended nature of the design. And, and it was designed to create maximum interaction between the users. And this was a small po a possible future, a, a microcosm of a possible future in Panama of, of, of proactive participants just getting together to figure out what we can do towards a better, better future. And all this was happening in the backdrop of the amazing natural backdrop of Parque Omar, and also with first class production of musical concerts and cultural activities going on. And all this for completely free. I still remember when we were talking about a free festival for the whole public, people were telling me I was crazy. It has to be economically viable. How can you just give that away? But that's the way we had to do it. And after the first festival, we realized that the, the, the communities that we were able to activate, they kind of wanted to keep being engaged. So there was even more work for it. We were giving away for free, but it was even more work. So we decided to do uh, free lectures every month. We decided to do beach cleanings, educational workshops with collaborating NGOs. And what we concluded as a team was that there is actually a real demand for these types of venues, activities, events in Panama. And that there is a real hunger for topics such as science, culture, and education in all minds of Panamanians. There's no doubt about it. Not many people realize that our foundation just turned two years old this year. Everyone that comes to the festival for the first time, they're mistaken. They think that the festival has been going on for years. How come? How, how come not, is, is their first question. And a question that I get a lot, especially from fellow NGO operators, are like, how were you able to achieve such scale impact in such a short time? 
as you know, like the, the nonprofit world as an industry is, is a very challenging one. It's a challenging process. Of course, all NGOs are born with this incredible idea to change the world with the noble social cause. But there's a harsh reality when you start that adventure. Every NGO, the only way it can survive is to receive donations. And it makes it a lot more difficult when donors are more, more likely to give donations because they get this tax benefit. And if the NGO does not have the status to give that tax benefit, you're pretty much out of the donation market. And it sometimes takes years to achieve this status. In the meantime, what that means is that our, our yearning to change the world has to wait. Your NGO is limited. We were in the same boat. We are completely frozen, and I was desperately looking for a way to get out of this. I was looking for a third level for my NGO. So in retrospect, the way it, we, because we, we did figure it out, we had festivals already. In retrospect, our NGO was, was operating as many other social enterprises do all over the world. Social enterprises are organizations that apply commercial strategies to improve human and environmental well-being. It's basically a business with a social aim instead of maximizing profit. And this model exists in the US, Europe, Asia, even South America. But it didn't exist in Panama. So what we had to do is invent, emulate the function of a social enterprise by adding a private company to the, to the formula. So then the burden of fundraising would fall on the private company. But the private company would be able to do a, different types of commercial strategies to raise funds. Commercial strategies that are regularly not it's, it seemed kind of looked down upon if, for an NGO to do those kind of strategies. So what we did is we studied the global tendencies of corporate social responsibility of all the companies that are actually headquartered here, what they're doing everywhere else except for Panama. We studied it really profoundly. And we realized that with a, with a fresh visual and interactive connection with the people, these brands were not only able to give back to society, but they were reaping marketing benefits. So slowly, we, dis we gathered a big group, a community of corporate sponsors to, to, to in order to raise um, enough funds to do our festival within our first year. So the second year, we had 25,000 people in the park. It's amazing. And we were able to raise $250,000. What, th what this roughly means is that we gave away $10 worth to each person who visited the park. And for, that, for those $10, what were they able to receive? They got two full days of international scale concerts. They, had, they were surrounded by massive amounts of public art. We had the Smithsonian Institute participate with great educational scientific content. And one of my favorites it was the UN flea market. It was the first ever UN flea market in Panama where they were able to showcase for the first time all this organic handmade product that the rural community creates here in Panama. And the cool news is that we completely sold out. These guys went back home completely happy. And I still remember at the last day of the festival, uh, this renowned Panamanian band called Santos Jorge was playing. And if you guys know the band, they went through a tragic loss. And they stopped playing out. So it was an honor to have the band accept our invitation and play. And during the concert, he stopped. He just stopped in the, in the middle of a song in front of the thousands of people, and he made this lucid comment. He was basically saying how happy he was to be able to play in this open environment, in a safe environment where his family could see him play. Because normally, when these bands play out, the only venues they would play is bars, nightclubs, alcohol. And many times, it was a mystery for his kid what, his, what daddy was doing at night. So for him, it was a priceless, priceless experience. For me, for the singer's family, they were able to reach the third level, at least for a moment. So Festival Abierto, for me, opened up portals to each own's third level, to inspire, to awaken, and to imagine a, a better possible human environment. Festival Abierto, it's just a cross-section of a desire that exists in, in, in our society today, a longing for a more spiritual and more cultural environment in the city. So hearing this kind of comments from an invited uh, singer made 
me feel all the worthwhile, all the sweat and sacrifice me and my team had to make. But then when the festival is over and we, we're back to reality from this momentary high where we were able to imagine a possible future, it's a little depressing always. You are from a super hypnotic, you know, everything is possible, down, back down to, to earth, to reality, to this. And, and the taste in my mouth is still there. Like the hunger for, for that space is still there. And we all want to go back to that third level. So how do, how, what can we do to make this third level a little more permanent? Right? What can we all do to have a more permanent state of this happy place? Well, at least for me, when I'm literally with my bare hands building the festival at the park, I'm reaching out to the third level. And it is the third level where I'm writing you guys from today. So I think it is now your turn to find your third level and make it a reality. Thank you very much.